mental health wise, I thought I was okay. I um I left the Air Force in 2019. I actually started to injure my neck quite badly just from wearing helmet MBGs, which are the night vision goggles. Um, and whenever you're wearing those, then you get a counterbalance to put in the back of your helmet. So you're yeah. essentially tripling your head weight. <laughs> and as, as a crewman, you don't stand straight all the time. You know, you're hanging out under the aircraft and you're rotating your head. So you're essentially just asking for trouble. Uh, and my neck packed up and uh, eventually I left in 2019 because I couldn't fly anymore. And they offered me a desk job, but it was like, no, I joined the Air Force to fly. So yeah. I don't want a desk job. I, did, I tried it for three months, but I kept looking out the window at Chinook taking off and went, no, just, I'm off. I'm off. leave, yeah. And I was okay. I remember thinking, how have I got out of this, you know, not just alive, but how have I got out of this in, in one piece? And and 2019 seemingly was all life was good. You know, it took me a while to find my feet again with like being a civvy, but airability that I mentioned a minute ago, they were really helpful. And, you know, they kind of give me that new sense of purpose. <laughs> and then we got locked down in 2020. So suddenly I was on my own with all like nothing but my own thoughts. And a lot of the coping mechanisms that I'd used, for a lot of the trauma that we've seen in Afghanistan, such as going to the gym, socializing with friends, keeping busy and burying your head in the sand, which we're all guilty of. Mm -hmm. It was all gone. It was just me on my own in my apartment. Couldn't really go to the gym or go running anymore. Obviously, everything was locked down. And as 2020 progressed, I started to come unraveled very, very quickly, it, it turns out. And I remember one night suffering, well, I was suffering from insomnia really badly. I'm playing through a lot of stuff in my head from Afghanistan. And I ended up looking through my logbook and looking up some of the merch sites I'd been on and looking up, just as we spoke about a moment ago, look at the back catalogue of those soldiers and that had died. And, you know, did they have fiancés? Did they have kids? You know, that kind of thing. And, and personalising them, which was very dangerous behaviour. Yeah. And, I mean, the red flags were all flashing at this point. You know, I was like... I'm not in a good way. But I didn't tell anyone. I didn't say a single thing because I just didn't want to burden anyone. Everyone was going through stuff in lockdown. I didn't want to be the problem child. And then in August 2020, just woke up one day and just wanted my brain to stop doing this, like stop stop talking, just quieten it. So I ended up that day, spent the entire day planning um, to take my own life. And that night, uh, took a huge overdose and, and tried to end my life. Thankfully, um, I, I survived. I was. Um, I didn't know how I'd been picked up. I came busy. Um, took a huge overdose um, of 95 amitriptyline, which is a horrible drug. Um, and woke up two days later in intensive care in Basingstoke, where I live, uh, with a, an incubation tube down to my throat uh, on life support. And uh, had no idea how I got there. You know, don't remember anything from after taking the pills. And it was only when I eventually got out of hospital a couple of days later, I was reunited with my phone, which had been left back in my apartment when it turns out the ambulance crew had picked me up. And I'd called the Samaritans at 10 to 1. I was on the phone for 13 seconds. And then I called 911 at midnight or at one o'clock in the morning, sorry. I was on the phone to them for about 15 minutes. So they must have, that's where I think the ambulance came in. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky. I lived next to the hospital and they said that if I hadn't lived next to the hospital, I probably wouldn't have made it. So, you know, I was really, really lucky. Um, but I remember leaving hospital and feeling quite euphoric, thinking, well, you know, that's rock bottom. It can only get better from here on in. You know, you can't, can't get much worse than wanting to end your life. And the truth is it wasn't, you know, that was just the lid coming off. And then I had to spend the next two years essentially putting all those files that I'd thrown everywhere that day back into my brain and processing them. Because it's really important to think when you have something like that is not to just scoop up the damage and put it back in there. It's to like read every file and kind of acknowledge that the trauma that I'd seen in Afghanistan, it was trauma and it's okay to feel sad about what I'd seen. And it's okay to have those emotions and then and then file them back in the back of the brain. And that's hopefully well this day. But it was a long journey. I was very lucky that I was a veteran because the mental health system, even to this day, is quite, you know, it, it's just underfunded, really. And a lot of civilians are on really long waiting lists. But I came out of hospital on the Saturday and was straight in with combat stress on the Monday. And I had PTSD resolutions uh, give me some counselling and then help the heroes give me some counselling and... And with the help of a lot of my old Air Force mates and, and family, managed to kind of get back on a level playing field. So it was um it was a hard eighteen months, but I'm uh, I'm through through it now, which is which is good. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, thank you very much for sharing that, Liz. Obviously, I know that's a tough time and it's tough to talk about as well. But uh, I mean, people going through it as well. Uh, would you say it stops, or is it, is it for you yourself? You don't have to answer this, obviously. Is it still ongoing? Is it manageable? 
No, and I'm really glad you asked that, actually, because there are a lot of people who suffer from PTSD. I know loads of people, certainly from Odium and Imagine It Life. Um, and it will it will haunt them forever. You know, some of their demons that they will never go away. I've been very lucky in that I feel like it was a chapter of my life. I processed it. And it is just that. It's a chapter. It's not my new label. And it's not something I intend to carry around like an anchor for the rest of my life. You know, I very much feel like I had PTSD. I processed it and now I'm moving on. And I think that's a really important thing for anyone who's kind of had it or is going through it is that the darkness doesn't have to stay with you forever. You know, there is light at the end of the tunnel and you actually do come out of the tunnel. You can leave the tunnel behind. So I think that's a really important message that you, it doesn't have to be your new label that you have PTSD forever. You can actually process it and move on. Now that's notwithstanding that every, every form of trauma is different. And there are some people who, who may not get through it, but certainly I've been quite lucky in that respect.